You want positional tears? Scott White has them. Welcome in to Fantasy Baseball Today. Frank and Scott here on Monday, January 22nd. And today on the show, we're breaking down first base and third base tiers, which are live on the site, cbssports.com slash fantasy slash baseball. And if you'd like to follow along, obviously uh, you can pull those up at your convenience. Plus, we have some news from the weekend. Reliever Robert Stevenson signed with the Angels. And we have some other interesting tidbits. Scott, I always uh, kick off tiers week with some variation of this question. But... What is the point of tiers in fantasy baseball and how should people use them in their draft or auction? Well, the point of tiers is to ensure that you're maximizing the return of every draft pick you make. Uh, and the way this is accomplished is by combining those portions of the rankings where you're, you're really just kind of parsing player value that there there aren't huge distinctions between the players they're all more or less just as valuable as one another and i do this within positions itself i mean i suppose there are other ways you can tier it uh independently of positions i've, I've tried doing tiers according to skills before you could just take an overall rankings and try to tier it that way but i think it's most effective to do it positionally because when you do that, as the draft is progressing, you can know with a fair amount of confidence what is the most urgent position to draft. It's the one whose active tier is closest to depletion. You know, if you've got six players left in the active third base tier and two players left in the, the active outfielder tier, probably should draft an outfielder because there's a good chance one of those six third basemen that are more or less equivalent according to the tiers is going to make it back to you. So that's the basic idea, and I'm a big believer in it. Some years I find it more useful than others. I will say that the infield positions are, are by and large so strong this year that it it might not be as useful this year as as it has been in other years. But it's still... It's still a handy uh, tool to have at your disposal during a draft, just to make sure, you know, just, just to keep yourself honest, to make sure you're not reaching unnecessarily at a position. And how do you actually put them into use while drafting, Scott? Like, do you have your rankings up somewhere, like on an Excel sheet, and they're kind of like marked off by tiers, and you're like crossing names off? Or is it just mm -hmm. like you've done this so much that you just kind of have an idea of, of what the tiers are? Oh, no, I actually, so if you go to the site right now, there's there's an individual article for each position, relief pitcher tiers 1.0, third base tiers 1.0. And if you if you go in, in, into one of those articles, you'll see the players uh, listed according to my rankings, but then divided into tiers. I give the tiers different names, like I'm looking at relief pitcher now. There's the elite, which includes Devin Williams, Josh Hader, Edwin Diaz. Then there's the near elite which includes like nine different names. And as the draft is playing out, so I, I have a I have a like a word document with all the positions combined, just catcher, catcher tiers, first base tiers, you know, get them all on one page, basically. I bring that page with me to a draft and I cross off names as the draft is going. And that way I can see very clearly how many is left at each uh, it, in the in the active tier at each position side by side and i feel like for years i mean we're not the only ones like obviously this is you know been out there for for quite some time but when doing an auction or a salary cap draft i think people kind of have this idea of like clear endings of tiers right let's just say for example we're going to talk about the first rounders in uh, your first base tiers freddie freeman matt olson bryce harper Say the first two have already been drafted in an auction or a salary cap draft. There's a chance that the final name in that tier could go for more than the others because people realize it's the end of that tier. And, and it's things that I've noticed in the past as well. So, like, I would say just as um, a word of advice, if you like a player in that tier, I would say either nominate that player a little bit earlier 
or if someone else nominates them, maybe try and get in on the bidding. Uh, so it's not like you're bidding on the final player in that tier, if it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I certainly understand what you're talking about. And, you know, it, it, it is worth reminding everyone that not everybody's tiers are going to be broken down the same way. So what you might think is the last player in 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 the current tier at third base, you know, another person might see three other players in that tier. And so it's the lack of consensus there doesn't always make it crystal clear what you should do. I, I've noticed in an, I've noticed too in an auction scenario like you're talking about, I will think, okay, there are two players left in a tier. I need to go for the second to last one because I know that last one's going to be more. But then it's like everybody thinks the same. You know, we we kind of we kind of like out outsmart each other that way. And then the last it's it's actually the last player in the tier that goes for a lot less, and we we each uh tried to do outdo each other for the second to last player thinking the last player would go for too much so it's you know every auction plays out differently every salary cap draft plays out differently and um you know that's that's why all of all of the advice for that format in particular there are more guidelines than rules i would say because no two ever play out the same way you are absolutely right, Scott. And I've had people ask, how much should I bid on this player? What's this player's value in an auction or a salary cap draft? And I obviously, we can give you an idea. We could say, all right, well, we have this player listed for this amount of dollars on the website. You know, that should be whatever. That's the, the foundation. But man, so, like drafts, those formats are so different from like each draft to the next that it's really more of like a range of what you'd be willing to pay on a player. But We'll save that for another day. I mean, we could do like a whole strategy podcast on, on just auctions and salary cap drafts, which I think would be pretty useful. Let's get into uh, first base tiers, Scott. And as I mentioned, the first tier includes the first rounders. And that has Freddie Freeman, Matt Olson, and Bryce Harper as part of this mix. No surprise, Freddie Freeman, one of the most consistent players over the past decade, honestly. Matt Olson coming off a huge breakout season with over 50 home runs. Bryce Harper is maybe a name that might surprise some. He got off to a slow start in his return from elbow surgery, but he flipped a switch over the final two months. Scott looked a lot like Bryce Harper during that span. 299 batting average, 16 homers, OPS over 1,000, awesome quality of contact. And that leads me to believe Bryce Harper is probably going to be just fine, and, and that's why he's part of this tier. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the way he turned on the power after a couple months into his recovery, obviously the, the quickest return from Tommy John's surgery ever, it stood to reason there would be some negative effects from that, from making it back soon, so soon. And, and during the postseason, I mean, especially during that series against the Braves, Bryce Harper just seemed like he could hit a home run anytime he wanted. Of course, a two-time league MVP, so he has uh, a first-round track record, first-round pedigree in fantasy. And so, yeah, I thought it was more appropriate to tier him with Freddie Freeman and Matt Olson than, than with what follows at the first base position. You'll notice also, if if you're a longtime follower of my tiers, I've kind of renamed them a little bit. I did notice that. Yeah. I mean, they've been around for... Pff, they've been around as long as I've been writing about fantasy baseball, so over 15 years. I actually think... And there's no way to go back and prove this, but I, I'm I'm pretty sure I popular popularized the concept of tiers within the the fantasy industry because when I started, nobody was writing about them, and now they're like just a mainstay. This this it's funny because Dave Richard and I had an argument about this recently. He thought he did, and I said no. My my I, I wrote a I wrote about him in 2008, my first year writing about baseball for CBS. So he went back and looked, and he was like, yeah, I wrote about him in 2008, too, just later in the year because it was football season instead of baseball season. So we kind of uh, rubbed off on each other that way, I guess. But yeah, they, they've been around for a long time. A lot of places just do Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3. I, I, I like to be a little more descriptive in my tier titles. And so as I've talked about throughout the offseason, there are in my mind, I think it's 17 first round caliber hitters, obviously more than can fit in a first round. 
but I want to distinguish those hitters from other really good hitters who don't fit in that first round tier. So, so I've named a tier at each position, the first rounders to really distinguish them from um, what might be deemed as a larger tier of just elites. And I noticed, you know, exactly that. I mean, sometimes these players that have performed like first rounders or should be valued that way, they have slipped a little bit in some of, you know, the actual drafts that I'm playing out, the mock drafts that we've done. I We did a mock draft last week on Thursday night, Scott, and I believe you got Bryce Harper at pick 23, which I was, you know, how did this happen for Scott? I mean, everything's coming up, Scott, right now. Obviously, this is a mock draft in January, but that sure. seems like really good value. So if anyone's getting Bryce Harper in like the mid to late second round, I, I absolutely love that. Yeah, no, I mean, me too. We had another one. Or, 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 so this was the second Roto mock draft I think we've done for 2024. In the first one, Matt Olson, another member of this tier, went with the very last pick of round two. So the person who got Ronald Acuna also got Matt Olson. Crazy. Which is just unfair. I believe that was George Kurtz of Sports Grid. Um, and, and I think if, if I remember correctly, you had to pass up Matt Olson earlier in round two because you'd already drafted Freddie Freeman. Yeah, which you didn't have to, but you felt felt yeah, like you had that to. brings in a, a whole nother kind of strategy discussion of should you double down on players if they're the best player available? But again, I think we'll save that for another day. The sure. also elite tier. This is this is the one that follows the first rounders, and it includes just two names, Pete Alonzo and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And I think. Some people might argue, Scott, that Vlad doesn't deserve to be in this tier. If you look at his uh, OPS by year, something we've done a lot already this offseason, 772, 791, 1002, 818, and 788. So very clearly, one of those is not like the other, and that was Vlad's mm -hmm. near MVP season in 2021, where he hit 311 with 48 home runs, finishes the top player in fantasy baseball. It also happens that that season was kind of a weird one for the Blue Jays, where they played the majority of their games in minor league ballparks, uh, both of which were extremely hitter friendly. So I don't know if that's the exact reason. Feels like these renovations that they've made in Rogers Center have kind of suppressed offense and, and power so far. It's, you know, it's only been that way for one season so far. But what would you say, Scott, to the naysayers of Vlad Jr. being in this tier? Well, first of all, I'd say this is why I was saying that not everybody's tiers are going to look the same because I could understand somebody leaving Vladimir Guerrero out of this also elite tier with Pete Alonso. But I will point out Vladimir Guerrero last year was the fourth biggest underachiever by expected batting average and the 12th biggest underachiever by expected slug. He was a stud according to the Statcast data, which wasn't necessary. I mean, he was he was good by the Statcast data in 2022, but it, it was much better in 2023. 2023 looked a lot more like 2021 than it did 2022. And I, guy hasn't turned 25 yet. He'll be 25 by opening day, but he's like just now entering his prime. He already has a year where he was the best player in fantasy, and all the underlying data looks amazing. And I think in the long run, we're going to think of Vladimir Guerrero as a first round type hitter in fantasy. And so I, I actually see it as something of a buy low opportunity right now. He's he's falling well into round three in even in some 15 team drafts, much less 12 teamers. So I want to give myself an opportunity to draft him. And I fit, if I tear him lower than this, first of all, I think it's underestimating his upside. And second of all, I'm I'm going to I'm going to kind of like uh, box myself out from drafting him by putting him in a tier with lower caliber first baseman than with the higher caliber first baseman. So it's kind of a there's a certain element of gaming your tiers for your tastes, which of course you don't want to do too much because then it undermines the purpose. But if you're being honest in your assessment of players, then I think it's I think it's fine. All right, let's move on to the next tier. That is the Near Elite, which features, again, just two names here, Cody Bellinger and Paul Goldschmidt. Cody Bellinger also has outfield eligibility, remains a free agent. He's part of that uh, big group of four, the Scott Boris free agents, which 
typically Scott Boris players uh, do take a little bit longer to sign, and that's where we're at with Cody Bellinger, unfortunately. Paul Goldschmidt, Scott, had a bit of a down year. 810 OPS was his lowest since his rookie season. But the stat cast numbers are still really strong. 91.3 average exit velocity. Expected numbers look pretty solid. They were actually better than his 2022 season. And, uh, you know, I've noticed some videos of him working out at Driveline Baseball uh, this offseason. And obviously, Driveline, they do really good work with pitchers. But, you know, they've done great work with hitters the past couple of years as well. I can only see it being a positive. Uh, Paul Goldschmidt also entering a contract year. So I know he's older, but I kind of like it. It's like a, a bounce back opportunity for him. So this is why I'll, I'll point out why I didn't want to tier Gold, uh, Vladimir Guerrero lower, because if I'm tearing him with Bellinger and Goldschmidt, there's not any league where he's going to go after Bellinger or Goldschmidt. So I'm just not drafting Guerrero, right? I, I already said that, but I just wanted to reemphasize the point. Goldschmidt's actually one of my bus picks for this year. <gasps> I know. Spoiler alert, it's not out yet. It'll be up. It'll be up by the time most of you are listening to this, probably. But if I could get into that a little bit, I will say the most obvious reason, of course, is that he's 36, but Hang on, I'm trying to open my article here. So I got all the information ready for me. So he slowed down quite a bit in the second half. Um, second half of the year. Did you already give these numbers? I did not. Okay, yeah. Second half of the year, Goldschmidt hit 246 with a 763 OPS. Um, the, the most alarming thing to me, though, I, I think the clearest indicator of Paul Goldschmidt beginning to show his age is what he was doing on fastballs specifically. So first of all, I'll point out the numbers way down in the second half, the exit velocity is way down in the second half. For the season, I don't even have to break this down first half, second half. For the season against fastballs, Paul Goldschmidt, who is a career 307 hitter uh, with a 995 OPS against fastballs, easiest pitch to hit, straightest pitch. You know, usually players have their best numbers against fastball. Goldschmidt, no exception. 307, 995 for his career. This past year, he hit 238 mm. with a 797 OPS. When players get older, it, it's not uncommon to see the fastball no longer become no them no longer have their best numbers against the fastball because they're they're you know their bat's slowing down a little bit. They're having a hard time harder time catching up with that heat. And given that the, that second half drop off corresponds with you know it, it happened in the year where he has these terrible numbers against the fastball and it's when he's 36. I don't know. Father time's undefeated. It it may be we may be getting a whiff of him here for Goldschmidt. And so uh I'm not saying I want to draft him. I actually think that his ADP is a little lower than I have him. But if you are going to draft Goldschmidt, you have to understand the risks here that, you know, a, a player his age shows signs of decline like that. You can't just dismiss it as random noise, obviously. Mm -hmm. Paul Goldschmidt's ADP so far this offseason is 78 over at the NFBC. So... Uh, yeah, I would say that's a little bit later than I would expect. Uh, definitely some fair concerns there. I know some people brought up uh, last offseason, Jose Abreu, his numbers trending down against fastballs. And then we all saw what Jose Abreu did last year. So uh, perhaps they were onto something and perhaps you are onto something as well, Scott, regarding Paul Goldschmidt. The next best things tier includes Christian Walker, Tristan Casas, Spencer Steer, Spencer Torkelson, Yan D. Diaz, Vinny Pasquantino, Josh Naylor and Christian Encarnacion Strand, who we will point out is one tier lower in a points league. Why is that? Well, the plate discipline, not so great for Encarnacion Strand. 5.8% walk rate uh, with a 28.6% strikeout rate and maybe some playing time risk. Obviously, you do want a lot of volume, a lot of plate appearances uh, in points leagues as well. Yeah. This is where things kind of open up, Scott. We see a good amount of names here in the next best things tier. And it looks like a tier I won't mind shopping in if I if I do miss out on some of the early round first baseman. 
One that I wanted to ask about, did you consider Christian Walker being in the previous tier, back-to-back seasons with 33-plus home runs, 94-plus RBI, also kind of getting up there in age? I could understand the argument, but personally, no. I'm much more excited about the prospect of drafting a Tristan Casas or a Vinny Pasquantino than I am a Christian Walker, and I would hate to tier them in such a way that I'm going to block myself out from doing that. Like I'm going to, I'm going to fill up the spot with Walker who I'm less excited about drafting. I think I would actually be more likely to drop Cody Bellinger and Paul Goldschmidt into this tier and make it even larger. Given that I have concerns about both of them. I just laid out my bus case for Paul Goldschmidt. Also spoiler alert, Cody Bellinger's among my bus picks for 2024. So um, I, I, I don't, I don't know how motivated I am to actually draft from that two player near elite tier of Bellinger and Goldschmidt, given that there are such exciting upside plays here in the next best things. Uh, you know, there, there are concerns, obviously. I, I think it's, I, I think, for example, the, the possibility of Tristan Casas continuing to sit against lefties is why I'm I'm leaving that tier distinction for now. Uh, Spencer Torkelson, he's got a a home park that really suppresses his power production. I mean, he still hit what thirty home one home runs last year, so he was still able to hit for power. But two thirds of those home runs were on the the road, and his home venue isn't changing, so it it limits Spencer Torkelson's upside. Uh, Yandy Diaz, who's in this tier, coming off a career year at an advanced age and not a lot of power for a first baseman. And he plays for the Rays, who like to to mix things up, don't tend to stick with the same lineup day after day. So there are a lot of reasons to think maybe Yandy Diaz won't live up to expectations. Vinny Pasquantino, the final numbers didn't look that great. No, I think it's because he was playing with the bad shoulder for a while because through mid-May, his numbers looked exactly like you expect them to, to expected them to. But maybe that's not the case, or maybe just the fact he's coming off shoulder surgery, Vinny Pasquantino is not going to look quite right uh, next year. So that's why there is this distinction between them and the Bellingers and Goldschmidts of the world. Even though I, I see downside risk for Bellinger and Goldschmidt, I think their realistic floor is still probably higher than a realistic floor for a Vinny Pasquantino. But in terms of ceiling and likelihood of reaching that ceiling, I, I feel like those tiers are pretty close. Yeah, and based on this tiers approach, Scott, I would nearly guarantee that you will not have a single share of Christian Walker this offseason because his ADP is 87.9 and Vinny Pasquantino is right around pick 170. So mm-hmm. based on the tiers approach, no reason to uh, reach up on Christian Walker when you can go ahead and get Vinny Pasquantino almost 100 picks later based on early ADP. Let's take our first break. When we return, we'll wrap up the rest of first base tiers. We'll do that here on Fantasy Baseball Today. The biggest event in sports is coming to the entertainment capital of the world. CBS Sports HQ will have you covered every minute leading up to Super Bowl 58. CBS Sports HQ at the Super Bowl. Getting you set with all the critical analysis you need. This league is decided by quarterbacks. He showed a lot of character in that moment. Great perspective, Joe Cena. It's the moment you've been waiting for all season long. Ready, set, face. Welcome back in. We'll pick things back up with first base tiers, and we're up to the fallback options, which includes Reese Hoskins, also a free agent coming off of a torn ACL, all but confirmed he will not be back with the Philadelphia Phillies. Where will he play? We have no idea. Jamer Candelario, who is now with the Cincinnati Reds, Alec Bohm, Ryan Mountcastle, Nate Lowe, and Isak Paredes. Uh, Scott, are we at the point in the first base tiers well maybe not based on the name it might be obvious fallback options right um would you prefer these more as your corner infielder let's say in a roto or a categories league uh compared to your actual starting first baseman in fantasy yeah yeah i would say so that would be my preference if you do have to have one as your starting first baseman it's not a disaster that they're fallback options it's kind of right there in the name of the tier right yeah 
especially in the case of of Hoskins, who, you know, entering last year, we we saw as a starting caliber first baseman in fantasy, coming off a significant injury, and and right now, we don't even know what his destination is. I think it's it's fair to downgrade him a bit, but you know he could be fine. Jamer Candelario is one of my sleeper picks for this year, going to Cincinnati. Uh, Bohm was certainly startable last year, as was Isak Paredes. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think you could live with any of these guys as your starter, but it is an ideal, and it it there's really no need for it to happen, given how loaded the previous tier is. And what we have here is another very big tier. So this is another thing that tiering positions can do is, is kind of give you a, a, a sense of the distribution of talent at the position. The, the top three tiers at first base had a grand total of seven players. And then the fourth tier itself had more than seven players. It had uh, eight players in it. And... You know, now we're looking at another very big tier here in the fallback option. So first base is a position with a lot of like serviceable starters, but kind of light at the top. It's not it's not a super studly position. So you could go either way there. I mean, you you could read it as okay. Uh, so I'll be I if if I go for a first baseman early, I'll be one of the few people in my league who has a true stud at that position. That'll give me an advantage over my competition. Okay, that's a reasonable way of looking at it. Or look at it another way. If I pass up first base early, there's still a lot of talent there, a lot of useful bats there to to, you know, maybe I'll be a little weaker than some of my competition, but I'll I'll be strong enough. Strong enough to be competitive. Uh, even if I'm sacrificing a little bit there. And I think to a certain degree, it depends on the depth of your league. You know, if you're playing a 10 team league, I think it's more important to get a true stud at first base from the, the very few options to choose from. But if you play in a deeper league, like a 15 team Roto league, I think as a general rule, you don't have to be as concerned about, uh, uh, about distinguishing yourself from the competition at particular positions. You mostly just want good, solid production at every position. And so you might be more inclined to say, oh, first base is really deep if you play in a deep league. All right, let's move over to the last resorts tier, and it also includes a ton of names. Justin Turner, who is still a free agent. I've seen him linked to the Mets, the Blue Jays, the D-backs this offseason, so we'll wait and see on Justin Turner. Andrew Vaughn, Anthony Rizzo, Jose Abreu, Brandon Drury, Josh Bell, and Ty France. Scott, I'm not just saying this. Because I'm a Yankee fan, but of all the names in this tier, I feel like the best opportunity is for Anthony Rizzo. If he can bounce back to full health, uh, obviously was dealing with the post-concussion syndrome last year. His first 53 games before the injury, we mentioned this last week, he hit 304, 11 homers, 880 OPS, was hitting a ton of line drives, and is now projected to bat cleanup in that Yankees order, you know, just behind, hopefully, Juan Soto and Aaron Judge. So... Of all these names, I, I think the perhaps the biggest upside or opportunity lies with Anthony Rizzo. For me. I don't disagree. Between Justin Turner, Andrew Vaughn, Anthony Rizzo, Jose Abreu, Brandon Drury, Josh Bell, and Ty France, the one I'd be most likely to call a sleeper is Anthony Rizzo. Yeah. And at times I've been tempted to move him up the rankings because that, that that's such a clear correlation there between the you know, what the numbers look like before the concussion and after it. I, you read about what he was going through when he was playing through the concussion. There's, there's no way he should have been playing with that. It's, it's kind of makes you angry to be honest. So, you know, I, I want to grant him that benefit of the doubt, but there is reason for doubt because he's 34 and because it was such a significant concussion. I, I mean, we've, we've seen players who are never the same after suffering a concussion like that. So uh, particularly given that he's already on the older side, I, I think there, there's certainly no guarantee Anthony Rizzo bounces back as anything useful in fantasy, in which case maybe he has the most downside of this group. Yeah, that, that might be true. So perhaps in a deeper league, that's something you keep in mind, but he goes so late. I mean, even in that Roto mock we did, 
last week. I think I wound up with Rizzo as my utility bat in maybe one of the final three rounds of the draft. So you can get him really late. Big upside, but I would agree also big downside for Anthony Rizzo as well. The leftovers tier is one that is loaded with names as well. Jonathan Aranda, Alex Kirilov, Kyle Manzardo, prospect with the Guardians, Luke Raley, DJ LeMahieu, Ryan O'Hearn, Nolan Shanwell, Wilmer Flores, Lamont Wade, Jake Cronenworth, Carlos Santana, Roddy Telez, who is now with the Pirates, and Ryan Noda of the Oakland A's. Scott, uh, really want to move on here, but is there anything you want to say quickly about this tier or not really? Doesn't really I mean, is there ever a series of names that makes you think of me more than Jonathan Aranda, Alex Kirilov, and Kyle Manzardo? Yeah, I mean, especially there. those first two. My gosh. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess just my point with that is even though it's the last tier at first base, it's the leftovers tier, there's upside to be found. It's you know, obviously long odds for any individual one of those players to become an impact fantasy player this year. But the, the potential is there. There are reasons that I like all three of them. Right now, I would say Ronda's clearly my favorite, which is why he's the first of the group. But uh, I haven't. I, I like Manzardo a lot, and I haven't completely lost faith in Alex Kirloff. I probably should have asked you this earlier, but are the names ranked within the tier in the order you yeah. draft them? Yeah, I try to just go through my rankings and list them okay. there. Uh, it gets a little sticky since I only have one set of tiers and two sets of rankings, Roto and Head to Head. Right. But for the most part, they're they're listed in the order I rank them. Though you're not really supposed to pay attention to that when you're doing tiers. All right, before we hit the news and notes, FBT is a finalist for the best baseball podcast category in the Sports Podcast Awards, and this is the final week to vote. Thanks to all of our listeners, we actually won the award last year, and now we're looking to go back-to-back. -back. So to help us bring home the hardware, you can find the link in the podcast and YouTube descriptions, or you can scan the QR code on the top right corner of the screen. The whole process should take less than a minute. And we would really appreciate it. Thank you for your continued support. Let's hit some news and notes, Scott. We did get some reliever news over the weekend. And the Angels signed Robert Steventon Stevenson to a three-year, $33 million deal. Uh, basically, right after we wrapped up our Josh Hader emergency podcast, this, new, this news came out. The career numbers are not great for Stevenson. It's a combination of starting earlier in his career and you no know, pitching in Colorado, which obviously is is not great, but uh, career 464 ERA, 134 WHIP, much better last year. Breakout season, 310 ERA, a .88 WHIP, and he latched on with Tampa Bay in June. Scott, he picked up this new cutter, and he was awesome. I mean, after joining the Rays, he had uh, I didn't I didn't write down the I numbers. Have the numbers here after joining the Rays. Robert Stevenson had a 235 ERA. Okay. 0 0.68 whip. 14.1 K per nine in his four months with the Rays. And of course, the Rays have a history of doing this, acquiring a pitcher and knowing exactly what they need to teach him to unlock his full potential. And Robert Stevenson is as clear an example of that as, as anybody. I mean, he was a former top pitching prospect for the Reds back in the day. So, there was always this latent talent that he just never capitalized on. And now at age 30 seems to have figured it out. That cutter by season's end, he was throwing it like 75% of the time. It was such a good pitch for him. And as impressive as those numbers are, the 235 ERA 0.68 whip 14.1 K per nine. It gets even more impressive than that. So for the season, I'm, I'm counting his time with the pirates for the season. Robert Stevenson had a 24.8% swinging strike rate. Number one in baseball among pitchers with at least 50 innings. Second was Felix Bautista at 20.8. He was four percentage points higher than the second place pitcher in swinging strike rate was Robert Stevenson. And I got this number from MLB trade rumors. The second one. So during his time with the Rays, so we're back to talking to that four-month period with the Rays, opposing batters put the ball in play um, against Steven. They put, Stevenson. They put it in play, so they made contact. 
in fair territory just on just 49.3% of their swings. Now, I don't really have a frame of reference for that, but that was first place during that four-month period in baseball. 49.3% of their swings, they put the ball in play. Second place, Aroldis Chapman, 59% of their swings. <laughs> 10 percentage point difference between first and second place. He was unhittable. So, I mean, by those measurements, you could make a case Robert Stevenson is the best reliever in baseball. It's over a four-month sample. I get it. But uh, he should be the Angels' closer. I mean, Carlos Estevez imploded down the stretch and was never really never really stood out as a reliever before last year. 6.59 ERA in the second half for Carlos Estevez with way too many walks. I, I haven't seen anything indicating the Angels plans one way or another, but like Stevenson should be the guy. Yeah, so I read an article from Sam Blum of The Athletic, and he wrote that Carlos Estevez figures to be the incumbent closer. And that's kind of where it, it started and ended. It He didn't really elaborate yeah. too much on that. But I think if nothing else, this signing makes the leash much shorter for Carlos Estevez for the reasons you much mentioned the second half numbers and just how awesome Robert Stevenson really was. So um, after the signing, did you move Stevenson up in your rankings at all? I haven't officially yet because I was hoping to hear more and haven't heard much more. But I I, I feel like I, I got to rank him ahead of Estevez at least because I... I you know, maybe it won't be right at the start of the season, but it feels like an inevitability. And I'm probably going to tier him ahead of put him in a, a higher tier, even than Carlos Estevez. So the fallback options tier at relief pitcher, it's another spoiler alert for you. Jose Alvarado, Clay Holmes, and, and Jose Leclerc. I, I think I'm going to tier Robert Stevenson with those guys. A lot more upside than those guys, but just given yeah. the uncertainty of the role, that's as high as I can go with him. All right, the Astros had their fan fest on Saturday where it was revealed GM Dana Brown had conversations with Ryan Presley before signing Josh Hader. And I actually saw this quote from new manager Joe Espada in an article over on The Athletic. Quote, we have an elite bullpen, elite three guys that could close any games at any time. I will sit down and I would like to assign roles for these guys so they know exactly how they're going to be deployed in the game. But like we've done in the past, if it's the eighth inning where there's some lefties and that might be a better pocket for some guys, that might be his inning. But I would like to have an established role for these guys. That makes it sound to me, Scott, like Josh Hader uh, could be used in the eighth inning at times. I mean, very clearly, he's the only lefty of those, you know, Ryan Abreu and Ryan Presley. So it kind of feels like he was alluding to Josh Hader there. But also at the same time, if they have set roles, yeah. I guess his Josh Hader is going to be the closer. So, like, yeah. how often does that happen? A handful of times throughout the season? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's... I still... I got it's, some It's exactly too. what I was expecting it to, to, to be, basically. Hader's the closer, but there will be rare circumstances where he enters in the eighth and maybe isn't allowed to finish the ninth because of that. But it's not going to be often enough that... Uh, to, to impact the rankings in a meaningful way. I got some pushbacks, Scott. I mean, people were tweeting at me. I'm not all people, but some people were saying, oh, Ryan Presley is still the closer. You know, the Astros loyalty, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I heard some of that too. I mean, I saw some of it even before we did our, I don't our emergency it. pod. I don't believe it one bit. Yeah, I, I don't know. Some people just like to say the sky is falling, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, I guess to get people on the other side who who don't want to, who are slow to admit a, a, a bad development for a player of value. But I, I don't know. I feel like you see more the other way where, like I said, people want to claim the sky is falling, even though there's no good reason to claim it. From the Astros closer role to maybe the White Sox. They signed John Brevia to a one year, five and a half million dollar deal on Saturday and in his career has a 342 ERA, 119 whip, over a strikeout per inning. Last year averaged 94.5 miles per hour on the fastball with an 11.9% swinging strike rate. Gregory Santos, who 
ended the year, I guess, kind of as the closer for the White Sox, might not be ready for the start of the uh, spring training because of right elbow inflammation. Rebia only has two career saves, Scott, but this kind of reminds me of the A's signing Trevor May last offseason. The White Sox just gave John Brebbia five and a half million dollars for what reason? I mean, my guess is okay, let him let him be the closer. If he performs well, they could flip him at the deadline for anything. So that's what I think is gonna happen. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I, I think if 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 Santos isn't ready to go, it'd be more of a committee type of deal because it's not like Brebia has it's not like Brebia has been a shutdown reliever. But who else, just, you know, if they're if they're stretching crochet out as a starter, who else can mm-hmm. they use in that bullpen? Well, I, so bad. One, I one, I don't think they're going to have safe opportunities very often. True. And like it took us a long time to even really understand that Trevor May was the closer for the Ray, or for the A's because they so rarely had a save chance. And I mean, the Royals last year. We we never get, did get to the bottom of who the Royals closer was, uh, even when Scott uh, Scott Breslow was still there. So I, I think the White Sox are going to be in a similar situation, and I, I don't see anybody worth drafting from this bullpen other than Santos, and he's not going to be, you know, he, he's not going to deserve a heavy investment. Look at some of the other names in this bullpen: Jimmy Lambert, Tim Hill, Davey Garcia, Tuki Toussaint. Shane Drohan or Drone. Yikes. I mean, <laughs> I think there's a chance for Brevia. It's got more so uh, Santos, but we'll see what happens if Santos is uh, healthy in spring training or ready for the start of the season. I did have some other non-reliever tidbits, but I do want to get to third base tier, so I'm going to save these notes for later on in the week, and there's nothing that's too pressing right now anyway, uh, so we'll save those. Let's take our final break. When we return, third base tiers here on Fantasy Baseball Today. Wake up to football highlights and news from around the world with the one and only Morning Footy Team. Rise and shine, football fans. Welcome to Morning Footy. Start your all-day football craze with Morning Footy, part of the all-new Galazzo Network. All right, here we are, third base tiers, and we'll start off with the first rounders, or rather, first rounder. Only one, Jose Ramirez, his NFBC ADP so far is 14.3. Why isn't he going higher? My guess is, Scott, maybe for the reason you mentioned earlier, there's 17 first round caliber hitters. Somebody has to fall a little bit in draft. So that's why I think Jose Ramirez is going a little bit later. He's going behind names like Trey Turner, Aaron Judge, Juan Soto, Shohei Otani on average. That won't happen in every draft. Hasn't really been happening in the mock drafts that we've done. Um, I know, you know, the power was down a little bit, 24 home runs, the counting stats as well for Jose Ramirez, Scott, but everything else under the hood, the plate discipline, stat cast numbers still good. I'm not really worried about Jose Ramirez. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm worried either. He seemed like pretty much the same guy as he's always been last year. I think part of what happened to Jose Ramirez is, is just... So stolen bases took off for well around the league. Stolen bases took off. I don't know if we did have, have we mentioned before that there were more stolen bases in the majors last year. It, it was the most stolen bases we've seen across the majors since 1987. So basically nobody playing fantasy baseball today has ever experienced a stolen base environment. Like we saw last year. Uh, I, I didn't realize it went quite that far back, but my, so my point in bringing that up with, with Jose Ramirez is while we saw Bobby Witt get to 50 steals and Corbin Carroll and a lot of those first round types with just the kind of stolen base numbers that bowl you over Ramirez still gave his 28, you know, he, he didn't keep up with the Joneses there. So while he, he remained the same, the league around him improved and that kind of made him less of a big deal for fantasy, but certainly somebody who you could be thrilled to get with your second round pick. Cause I, I, I think he could still pass as a first rounder. Obviously that's why I have him in the first rounders tier here. And, uh, another thing to point out, part of what makes him the only first round caliber third baseman is that the depth at this position has improved so much. And you're going to hear in future tiers. Okay. So you hear the first tier here at third base. 
one player. Oh, it must be a weak position. Every other tier is going to be big because there's it, it, in a year's time, third base has gone from being the thinnest position to the fattest position. <laughs> it's, it, it's a remarkable turnaround. All right. All I have to, that's all I have to say about that, Frank. You seem <laughs> unsure. All right, let's move on to the also elite tier, which includes four names, Austin Riley, Rafael Devers, Gunnar Henderson, and Alex Bregman. Before everybody loses their collective minds, Alex Bregman is one tier lower in a categories league. So if we're just talking about points leagues, Bregman averaged 3.3 fantasy points per game on CBS last year, the same as Austin Riley and Rafael Devers. So obviously he's elite in that format. He drops down a tier in Roto or head-to-head -head categories leagues, not in head-to-head -head points leagues. Gunnar Henderson, Scott, he is the, the new name here, the arrival of one of those top prospects from last season, the unanimous AL Rookie of the Year, hit 28 homers, 10 steals, 100 runs scored, uh, got the batting average up to 255 after a slow start the first two months of the season. Um, does he deserve to be here? Does he truly deserve to be here, Scott? What do you think about that for Gunnar Henderson? So he was the single player I was most torn about when I was putting these tiers together because I, I remember in our first mock draft, I, I one and one of the principles I've had when drafting this year is I want to draft hitters until all the MVP caliber hitters are gone. And I kind of used Gunnar Henderson as the cutoff in our first mock draft. And so I went with, with in, in my, my third, with my third round pick in that draft, I went Kevin Gossman. Uh, I think Marcus Simeon and Jose Altuve went right before him and I had them queued up, but they went and I didn't think Gunnar Henderson quite met that cutoff. So I went Kevin Gossman instead, but now I'm tearing good. Gunnar Henderson in a way that would suggest he is as good as the Jose Altuve's and, and Marcus Simeon's of the world. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I feel. Part of the reason I did it, honestly, is because I knew I wanted to get Alex Bregman in this tier for points leagues. And in points leagues, I rank Gunnar Henderson ahead of Alex Bregman. Either I had to switch them in my points league rankings or I had to move Gunnar Henderson up to this tier as well. If I'm going to have Gun Alex Bregman in this point in this tier for points leagues, and Alex Bregman on a per game basis was as good as Austin Riley last year, so I feel like Alex Bregman in points leagues deserves to be in this tier. Okay, I I, I think Gunnar Henderson certainly has the upside to compare to an Austin Riley or Rafael Devers. Uh, his numbers. His, his break the, the breakdown for him last year, it was one of those last four months were a lot better than the first two months situations. So specifically, I'll give you the exact numbers. From June 1st on, Gunnar Henderson hit 276 with an 856 OPS, 23 homers, eight steals. You give him 50% more in those categories. You're, you're talking really high-end production. Obviously, Rafael Devers, Austin Riley, they don't give you steals at all. So if you can get 12 to 15 from Henderson, that counts for for whatever he may lag behind them in terms of batting average. And there's a good chance he just takes a step forward performance-wise in year two <laughs> as well. So it's it's a little bit of a riskier pick than those two. Uh, and, and I'm not saying I would absolutely pass up Austin Riley and Rafael Devers late in round two. But having Gunnar Henderson as an option behind them, I, I think is is what would prevent me from taking Austin Riley and Rafael Devers early in round two, you know? Fair enough. All right, let's move on to the near elite tier, which includes Manny Machado, Ellie De La Cruz, Nolan Arenado, Royce Lewis, and Ha Sung Kim. Machado underwent surgery on his right elbow extensor tendon which is, it's technically, it's probably like a fancy way to say he had tennis elbow for parts of the past two seasons. Um, the surgery takes longer on the throwing side than hitting, and it sounds like Machado could potentially open the season at designated hitter. Um, does that worry you, Scott, when um, tearing Manny Machado still in the near elite tier? 
it worries to it worries me to the extent that he's only in the near elite tier because my initial inclination was to put him in the same tier with Austin Riley and Rafael Devers, which is how we were drafting Manny Machado last year. It's how we've drafted him for most of his career. And I kind of think when when we get down to it in spring training and provided he looks healthy then, I I, I, I think we're going to see him move up draft boards quite a bit, and I may have to change what tier he's in. By the way, Ellie De La Cruz, if you just look at early ADP, at least on NFBC, which I think is higher than most of the other places, but NFBC has Ellie De La Cruz as the 21st overall player, NFBC ADP. So a, a lot of people would tier him with Austin Riley and Rafael Devers and make that also elite tier six players deep. Uh, you could make the justification it's actually six players deep by putting Machado and De La Cruz in it. Um, rather than how I have it with Machado and De La, De La Cruz tiered alongside Arenado, Royce Lewis, and ha Sung Kim. I don't know. Saying it out loud, I'm not even sure. I, I'm not sure I like it. And I'm not sure what I want to do about it, whether it makes more sense to move Machado and De La Cruz up or ha Sung Kim down, because they don't sound like they belong in the same tier, do they? That's exactly what I have written down on the rundown is that it feels weird to see Ellie De La Cruz and ha Sung Kim in the same tier. Yeah. I may have to revisit that. I, I may have just in my rankings, I may have ha Sung Kim too high. He's an interesting player. He's also among my busts for this year, uh, which may be now that I've written that is part of the reason I don't like it as much anymore. But Potential to be a big steals contributor, right? 38 of them last year. With triple eligibility, second base, third base, and shortstop. So in, in deeper leagues especially, ha Sung Kim could be a very handy pick. But just mentioning him in the same breath of as as in the same breath as Manny Machado and Ellie De La Cruz feels wrong to me. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure what I want to do about that yet, but I'm gonna I'm I feel like certainly in tiers 2.0, I'm going to have to change something there at the near elite tier at third base. I know you're not going to do this and you shouldn't do this cap, but it kind of feels like ha Sung Kim should just be in the ha Sung Kim tier. You know, like he's not near elite, but he's probably a little bit better than this next tier, which is the next best things, right? He's, he's kind of a tweener. So it's like, where do you kind of, where do you land on ha Sung Kim? Maybe if it's all right, your glass half full, he's one tier higher. Maybe if you're a uh, glass half empty, one tier lower for Ha Sung Kim, but I do agree he's mm -hmm. kind of a kind of a tough fit regardless. Well, and part of it too is I like I want him in the same tier at each of those three positions, and so that complicates things too because I'm I'm looking at second base. He's in the middle of that near elite tier instead of at the end of it, like he is at third base. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I I might be more inclined to move Machado and De La Cruz up, but then it feels like I'm selling Riley. Austin Riley short. I don't know. I'll I'll I'll, I'll think it over some more. But th this kind of speaks to the depth at third base that it's there's so many good players there. It's hard to find the divisions between them. All right, let's move on to the next best things tier, which includes Spencer Steer, Junior Caminero, who is one of the top prospects in the game, plays for the Tampa Bay Rays. Noel V. Marte, also one of the top prospects on the Reds. Max Muncy, Jake Berger and Josh Young. We talked extensively about Josh Young last week on our rankings debate podcast. Scott, are you worried at all about the uh, potential log jam here for Noel V. Marte? Or maybe that's the reason why he's part of this tier and not a tier higher, right? Maybe if, if we just had no concerns whatsoever, you could just say, boom, I'm going to pencil him in for 2020. That's what I think he could do. But, you know, lots of names on that Cincinnati Reds team. So, Causes a yeah. little bit of doubt for some of their players. Well, who else would play third base? Candelario? Yeah, I guess Candelario. Might, uh, they it, probably it don't want Encarnacion Tran doing that anymore. And they don't seem to like Spencer Steer there so much either. I feel like as long as Noel Ve Marte lives up to his end of the bargain, he'll just be the third baseman. Not saying he'll never get a day off or have a day where he shifts over to DH. That'll happen from time to time, but I, I'm more worried about Christian Encarnacion Strand's playing time than I am Noel V. Marte's playing time. 
provided he performs. I'll also mention that this Spencer Steer tier is the same tier where at first base you had Christian Walker, Tristan Casas, Spencer Torkelson, Yandy Diaz, Vinny Pesquantino, et cetera. So that, that was the first really big tier at third base. Think of all the names we've already covered at third base. And now we're to that same equivalent tier at this position. So that go, that shows that goes to shows to go you that sh goes to show you the relative depth uh, and, and how much stronger overall third base is than first base. That okay, this is still a very big tier at this position. Still a lot of names here: Josh Young, uh, Jake Berger, Max Muncy, and then the young guys. But um. You know, we've, we've already passed through so many names to get here, unlike at first base. And if we're just comparing the two tiers, the next best things tier at first base and third base, based on the names you read me, I would much rather shop in the next best things at first base uh, comparatively to this tier. Maybe you don't feel the same way, but, uh, you know, I guess just lining those up. I, I do like the names in uh, on the first base side compared to well, some of the names here. I guess the way I've been approaching it is I can, I'm willing to wait a long freaking time at third base. Cause I'm fine with Jake Berger as my starter. And in, in a, in a, in a, like a head to head situation where you don't have a corner infield spot to fill, that could be really late in the draft. Cause people only have one third base spot to fill and we're, we're more than 12 deep here. So that's kind of how I've approached it. Uh, and you know, that's not to say if it's not, if, if it's the right time to take Austin Riley in round two, I'll take Austin Riley in round two. If it's the right time to take Manny Machado in round five, I'll do that. But I, I find that having this many next best things at third base compels me to wait longer there than any other position. Jake Berger, by the way. Also a fan, Scott, I have him in my Breakouts 1.0, which will be published on Monday. Again, when most people are listening or consuming this, uh, should already be out on the site. But just a little sneak peek, Jake Berger transformed who he was in Miami last year. He lowered his strikeout rate, still had elite power metrics. You know, the StatCast data is off the charts. If he could somehow blend those two approaches together, I mean, we could see a, a truly elite player. I, and still, if he doesn't do that, he could just go back to being the guy he was last year, which was still a useful player. So I, I think the floor and the ceiling are both pretty high for somebody like Jake Berger, even though I guess he doesn't have the, the longest track record of performance. The fallback options includes Key Brian Hayes, Jamer Candelario, Alec Bohm, Isak Paredes, and Michael Bush. Scott Candelario, someone we haven't talked about really at all today. He's part of both positions, first base and third base. He's coming off a career year, and now he's headed to one of the best ballparks in all of baseball out there in Cincinnati. He's going to be in the middle of that lineup. The Reds paid him three years, $45 million. To me, he is the, the one constant. He will be in there uh, surrounded by other very talented players. And, man, this is – it's a great callback because if uh, – call out because if I miss out on everyone else, I don't think I'm really that upset about getting Jimmer Candelario as – my starter at either position, honestly. Yeah, I mean, if you look at StatCast, their home runs, expected home runs by ballpark, Candelario, who hit a career-high 22 home runs last year, would have had 30 if he had played every game in Cincinnati. Now, he's not going to play every game in Cincinnati, but he's going to play half his games in Cincinnati, and so I think 25 homers is a reasonable expectation. Candelario spent most of his career in Detroit, and now is going to Cincinnati, and the the most prominent player I can think of who did that was Nick made that same transition was Nick Castellanos, who was better in Detroit than Candelario was. But then when he got to Cincinnati, he was like MVP caliber bat for them. And uh, again, I'm not saying Candelario is going to be that, but if you, just the the if he if it's proportional, the increase in production going to Cincinnati, then I think he's going to be a very solid starter in fantasy. I'm thinking something like a 275 batting average with 25 homers and good counting stats in what could be a 
great lineup. But certainly the RBI total should be good for Candelario. Yeah, I I really like that call as well. Did want to quickly pull up where Castellanos finished that season because that, that is a great reference and way to think about things. Uh, again, not that Candelario is going to be this good, but Castellanos went from being, let's say, a serviceable option for fantasy to finishing as a top 20 player in 2021 when he hit, he hit 34 homers, 300. 300 batting average. You know, he was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. 309, 34 homers, and 939 OPS in his one full season in Cincinnati. Awesome stuff there. So um, we'll see. I, I have I have a pretty good feeling Candelario uh, is going to have a good season here for the Cincinnati Reds. The last resorts at third base includes Ryan McMahon, Brett Beatty, Matt Chapman, Eugenio Suarez, Yoan Moncada, Curtis Mead, and Jordan Westberg. Some interesting prospects in this mix, including Brett Beatty with the Mets, Curtis Mead with Tampa Bay, uh, and uh, Jordan Westberg with the Orioles. Someone else kind of interesting is Matt Chapman, I think, Scott. I mean, he's still a free agent, only hit 17 home runs. That was despite an elite 17% barrel rate. So that was fifth highest among qualified hitters. I, I really don't know what's going on in like Toronto at that ballpark, but it just has played weird so far. Um, anything on these prospects in this group and, and maybe a Matt Chapman power bounce back, depending on where he lands. I wouldn't say I'm especially hopeful for any of them. I still think there's a lot of upside for Britt Beatty, especially, but he got an extended look there for the Mets last year and did nothing with it. So while I wouldn't rule him out having rule him out having it from having a breakout season, you know, it's it's not worth a hefty investment because there's a good chance you won't get a good return on that investment. I, I I get your point about Chapman too. I noticed his pull rate was way down. And hitting it to right field seemed like a terrible strategy at uh, at Rogers Center. It's been for a couple years now, and so maybe maybe the change of environment will help. But you know, we we that's what we said when he went from Oakland to Toronto, and it didn't have that effect. So it's kind of hard to be that optimistic about Matt Chapman at this point. Though again, it's more of a I can't rule it out situation than oh, I think this is going to happen. And lastly, the leftovers at third base, Oswald Peraza, Anthony Rendon, Michael Garcia, DJ LeMahieu, Willie Castro, Luis Renjifo, Ezekiel Duran, Umer Flores, John Birdie, and two prospects, Colt Keith of the Detroit Tigers and Kobe Mayo of the Baltimore Orioles. Again, you can find both Scott's first base and third base tiers. Honestly, all of his tiers on the site right now, cbsports.com slash fantasy slash baseball. But here we had first and third base, and we'll be doing uh, all the other positions over the next couple of weeks. We're going to wrap there for Scott. I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we'll be back again on Wednesday. Bye-bye.